everyone and welcome to the damage report on a Monday, a fantastic Monday. That's why I have stolen John's seat as host of this show. Uh, that's it. That's it, you guys. We figured, uh, you know, John's had enough. He's, you know, he's really um, honestly like man spread all over this show. And I think it's time for me to take the reins for the last week. No, maybe just today. Uh, John is not feeling well. Uh, don't worry, it's not COVID, it is scurvy. So just send him some love and thoughts and prayers. Um, but we still have a great show because, wait a minute, it's not Fantastic Monday. It's Nina Turner Tuesday. Please welcome <laughs> Nina Turner. I don't know, I think it's all the tryptophan, Nina, that's like all the turkey that is in my body currently from Christmas <laughs> has got me confused. Also, because okay. I'm here on a Tuesday. Right. Um, Nina, how are you doing? Broken. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. all off. Yeah, it's okay. It could be it could be fantastic Monday if you want. If you want a Monday <laughs> do over, it's allowed. Let's do it over. How was yeah. your Christmas? It was okay. I definitely spent time with family, baking. You know, I got pictures, you know, with flour all over because it's not, you know, unless you got flour <laughs> everywhere, it's not real. Uh, with right. my two year old grandson baking sweet potato pies and, and pound cake. Two years That's in a row with him, Fran. It's, it's Can he actually do anything or is he just kind of overseeing stuff? Oh, no. Stuff? Oh, no. He cracks the eggs. I got to be careful with the shells, you know. <laughs> but uh, he's quite the chef. <laughs> That's adorable. Yeah. I mostly just How like. about you? Oh, I do the fake, like, put flour on my face and then come out like, oh my gosh, I baked all these Trader Joe's appetizers <laughs> for you. Yep. Uh, I'm, it was good, it was really good. It was nice um, to watch all my favorite Christmas movies and then realize, oh, I've grown out of these and these are bad. In fact, these are canceled. We should not watch these again. Um, but, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad to be here, glad to have everyone here. If you are here, make sure you're liking and sharing the stream right now. Here on a Nina Turner Tuesday, December 28th, the final week of this hellacious 2021. We're not saying a word about 2022, because who knows? We don't know, who knows what it's gonna be like. So just shh, very quietly, let's just move into this next year. Um, but thank you all for being here. We got a lot of, well, lot to get to. We're gonna be talking about the new CDC guidelines. Uh, hmm, I wonder where they came from. I wonder uh, why they're changing their tune in the middle of another COVID surge. We'll talk about that, we'll also talk about a uh, the January 6th insurrectionists getting PPP loans. This is very real, you guys, and it is my probably my favorite. And by favorite, I mean the most terrible story I've read practically all year. And also uh, yet another flight fight, you guys. It's all in the air, all right. All the good, the best fights, they're happening in the sky. So we're gonna look at that. Um, so Nina, are you ready to do this? I am ready, and I hope John feels better too. You know, I'm battling a little cold myself, so yes. I can totally understand. But John, we sending you love. The Dragon Squad is sending so much love. Sending love to John. I hope you get over that scurvy and whatever raccoon <laughs> bit you. Um, that's how you get scurvy. <laughs> so <laughs> let's talk about a, a man who everyone should know about and who did sadly pass the day after Christmas, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, a leader in the South African anti-apartheid movement and a Nobel laureate died at the age of 90 in Cape Town on Sunday. He was a humanitarian until his very last breath. He, after the apartheid regime was defeated in South Africa, he led the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which again was this attempt to take stock of the crimes under the apartheid regime and also heal a nation. Something I think a lot of us in the States are wondering, hey, maybe we need something like that here. Um, but it wasn't just in South Africa. Archbishop Desmond Tutu spoke out against the occupation of Palestine. He included, uh, including supporting a boycott of Israel, which is something that we know has been criminalized in this country. He spoke out in 2003 against the invasion of Iraq. He refused to share a stage with Tony Blair at the time um, because of Blair's support of the war. And he even talked about climate change as well as vaccine apartheid, as I know we've spoken a lot about on the show. A quote for you, he has far too many incredible quotes, but 
He says, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. If an elephant has its foot on the tail of a mouse and you say you are neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. And that's just a, such a funny quote because if you've ever seen Desmond Tutu speak, um, I had the privilege of doing so back in 2003. He's so funny. He's like lighthearted and hilarious and brings this spirit of joy to every resistance movement that he was a part of. Uh, Nina, your thoughts? Yeah, thanks for that, Fred. That's one of my favorite quotes from him and definitely he's very quotable. But it reminds me of another saying that if the hunter always tells the story, the lion's story is never told. And that's basically <laughs> what, what he's saying right there. It's all about the perspective. And then also, you know, you, you can't be neutral on a, on a moving train. Again, it's something else that comes to mind. A great historian uh, said that too. But no, he was a wonderful man, a, definitely a humanitarian by every, I mean, it just, he personified the mission of a humanitarian. And that truth and reconciliation that you brought up, friend, I have been crying out for that for so many years. I think we really do need to do something similar in the United States of America to deal with our own form of apartheid and yes. chattel slavery in this country. The sins have not been totally answered. And the fact that the archbishop was not afraid to stand up for the right of our of a Palestinian sisters and brothers, family and friends tells you a lot about the measure of that man. Uh, he will definitely be missed, but I, I certainly believe as I'm sure many do that his spirit and his legacy will live on. Yes, absolutely. He, um, he 100% is a case to be studied. Uh, just the, the role that he played. And the other thing that is important to say is he was a radical. You know, whether yeah. liberals like it or not, he was a radical. He being for BDS is, you know, supposedly a radical position, even though under South African apartheid, it was not. It became very understood that you had to boycott out South Africa if you ever wanted to apply pressure, you had to do it economically. Um, but he said a number of things. I just want to, you know, go to a, a few headlines here from uh, reporter Owen Jones who collected these. Um, he called the treatment of Palestinians by Israel apartheid. He was so didn't pull punches on that. He said openly, even though he's a religious man, he would never worship a homophobic God. And he said that and he said, quote, I would not worship a God who is homophobic. That's how deeply I feel about this. I would rather go to a homophobic, I would refuse to go to a homophobic heaven. No, I would say sorry. I mean, I would much rather go to the other place. I'm as passionate about this campaign as I ever was about apartheid. So essentially, like, nah, send me to the fiery one if you think that like it's okay to be homophobic in heaven or you know that your religion um, is it all homophobic. So that, that I thought was incredible. Um, and then finally, this is in 2012. People, not only. Was he speaking out about the Iraq war? But he continued to speak out in 2012. He said Tony Blair should face trial over the Iraq war. Like, yeah, Tony Blair, Blair and Bush. And then one thing that he did a lot was he spoke about how while whenever it's a Middle Eastern or African or Asian dictator, right? Those they're always held accountable at The Hague. But if it's George W. Bush, if it's Tony Blair, right? Those folks never get held accountable on an international level. Um, so he was out in front uh, speaking about that and applying that those rules of justice to everyone. And he really thought uh, of leadership as a moral position. I don't know, Nina, how you feel about that. You know, we're so, we talk about politics so much as sort of a strategy, a game, who's winning, who's losing. And for someone like Archbishop Desmond Tutu, it was, about a moral leadership. Um, and I feel like we don't have a lot of those these days. Maybe I'm speaking to one right now. <laughs> I would like to think so. I'm right with you, friend. I do believe that there has to be some morality that undergirds the mission. And I'm not talking about a type of morality that suppresses people. I'm talking about a type of morality that sets people free. And the fact that we should want other people, we should want for other people what in fact we want for ourselves. I mean, part of the golden rule, I mean, I come from black liberation theology. I often joke, friend, that you know, my mother, when she was alive, she was a preacher and my siblings and I had to go to church eight days a week. I mean, that's how serious my mama was <laughs> about this thing. And you know, part of a black liberation theology 
is very much rooted in the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And certainly the archbishop, again, personified that. And we are blessed to have had a leader like him. We need more leaders like that who are more concerned about the next generation than they are being invited to a fancy Christmas party or what other people may mm. say about them. It is the morally right thing, for example, to have Medicare for all, to have paid uh, medical leave, you know, family leave to cancel student debt, you know, those things that give people the opportunity to live out their greatest greatness, not just in this country, but all around the world. So I definitely receive what you just put down, friend, mm-hmm. in that I do consider myself. I'm a hell raising humanitarian. That's me. So, <laughs> but that's know. what he was too, you know? Yeah. And so it's, you know, I, I was, I, I say, I think we should all kind of try to be a little bit more like Desmond Tutu. And I think you, out of uh, most people that I know or have ever met, uh, live by that golden rule and lead with that morality. So thank you and obviously rest in power and rest in peace to yeah. the archbishop. Um, and yeah, let's let's continue his legacy. Speaking of someone who truly needs moral leadership, it's just a compass. Um, let's talk about the Schmeck who stole Christmas. So. It was just Christmas Eve and a father of four named Jared Schmeck um, decided to do what his family does every single year, which is call into what's known as the NORAD Santa Tracker, which tracks Santa's sleigh movement across the globe, which is very real and don't ever question that. Uh, Except for this time, uh, the people who were on the other line answering those calls from kids and their families uh, we're the president and the first lady, uh, President Joe Biden and Jill Biden. And Jared Schmeck had that opportunity, spoke to the president, told him all the things that his family wanted for Christmas, and then ended with this. Take a listen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you have a wonderful hey, Christmas. Well, yeah, I hope you guys have a wonderful Christmas as well. Oh, Merry thank Christmas you. and let's go, Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. I agree. <laughs> Let's go, Brandon. Yes, uh, the wackiest burn that the conservative movement has come up with that basically is code, special secret code for F Biden. Uh, And so you see Joe Biden's initial reaction is, ha, let's go, Brandon, as if he didn't hear him. He doesn't know what it means. And then Jill Biden just kind of the color drops from her face. But Nina, your first reaction to this moment and also President Biden's response to being told to F himself. I mean, it definitely was in poor taste. It wasn't even necessary, whether he agrees with the president's politics or not. They weren't in a heated debate over policy issues, right? It was a Merry Christmas and not for him, it was for his children. So it just didn't make sense. I could see if they were in a heated political exchange, then maybe. But they were not. It was a Merry Christmas. But, you know, Francesca, more than that, I'm kind of feeling like, who cares? <laughs> I, I, I really don't give a damn about this, honestly, <laughs> if I could just be honest about this. There's so much happening in the world right now, so much suffering. Um, to debate over and over again this man and this full outrage about what he said to the president. Yes, was it in poor taste? Yeah. Was he having a synapse lapse at the time, or did he really mean to to say that? You know. Sometimes people, you know, your mind is going really fast. You just think, oh, I'm just going to say this. It's, it's felt good in his mind. But when it came out of his mouth, and I know since then he's gone on with oh, Steve Bannon and saying that his uh, freedom of speech is being suppressed and all of this nonsense. Man, just own up to it. Either you had a snap slaps in the, in, the, in the midst of, you know, talking to the president of the United States of America, or you meant it. Just whatever it is. But ultimately, you know, the death threats the man is getting, you know, he's claiming he's getting threats and all that. That's just nonsense. And I think it's all a distraction too. We got other things that we should be giving our time and attention to. And guess what? The president's gonna be all right. He'll be all right. His his feelings will be fine for sure. Yeah. And I agree that it is largely a distraction. It just feels kind of so depraved to be on a phone call with the president of the United States and talk about your kids wanting a Barbie and a, like a Nintendo Switch mm-hmm. and then yeah. telling him to go F himself. It's just like, it, 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 but, but it is truly the most 
MAGA moment meets the most like uh, sort of old timey uh, Woody from Toy Story president we've ever had. And they sort of clashed right there. And Biden doesn't even know that he's being insulted. So there's that. I agree it's a distraction. But that being said, it's a fun distraction and uh, allow me to indulge myself a little bit longer. Um, <laughs> initially, Schmeck, who by the way is the perfect name for who, what kind of a person he is. Schmeck said, he's not a Trumper. But described himself as a quote, free thinking American and a follower of Jesus Christ. And that's why he told the president to go F himself on Christmas Eve, you know, in the spirit of Christmas. Um, he writes, quote, I understand there's a vulgar meaning to let's go, Brandon, but I'm not that simple minded, no matter how I feel about him. The 35 year old father said Christmas mornings. He seems like he's a cordial guy. There's no animosity or anything like that. It was merely just an innocent jest to also express my God given right to express my frustrations in a joking manner. I love him just like I love any other brother or sister. And now, as Nina alluded to, I'm being attacked for utilizing my freedom of speech, Schmeck said, adding that he's been receiving vague but threatening phone calls since a Santa tracker call. I don't know about you, Nina, but when I like love someone like a brother, I don't usually tell them to go F themselves. Although it depends, I mean, maybe we're in a, you know, a sibling spat. Um, but you, this having it both ways. I love Jesus Christ, and I just told the president to go f himself. I'm reminded of watching the Four Hours at the Capitol HBO documentary recently. They're on the lectern, insurrection is on the lectern, going in Jesus' name, Amen. Now I'm not a very religious person, but Nina, you just talked about being brought up in 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 that tradition, but in you know um, in a Black Liberation tradition. I don't know your thoughts on that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to stomach the tradition, we had to put some black liberation on it, uh, Francesca. I mean, we should not be surprised here. I mean, it was in the name of Jesus and uh, Christianity that the land of the Native Americans, our indigenous uh, sisters and brothers and family and friends was stolen. It was also in the name of Jesus, this beautiful Christianity, uh, that part of Christianity that uh, black folks were enslaved and told to obey their masters and and you you might just make it to heaven in the by and by everything is going to be all right but for generations we are going to enslave you and your offspring forever and turn the United States of America into a hegemon nation we're going to rape your women and your men at times we're going to deprive your children etc cetera, etc cetera. so friend the moral of the story here is that a lot of bad things happen in the name of Christianity and again what this did did, did on par to the examples I just gave, <laughs> uh, really pale in comparison. I am not surprised. People use religion for all kinds of nonsense and, and evil. But same on the other side of that, religion can also be used to uplift. So when all else fails, lean on Christianity, baby. <laughs> just yeah. that's so just true. On you could just, yeah. yes, some of the worst people have used it, yes, as you just mentioned, to justify the worst things. but. And as Nina alluded to, you know, there were, the jury was out. It was like, who was this guy? Was he just like a Joe the plumber, just just mad about vaccine mandates, even though he's totally vaccinated? Definitely not. Um, you know, was he someone who was just like, we're all frustrated about the supply chain, I guess. You know, like who was he? And the other day, as this saga has unfolded, we learned exactly who he is. In fact. He's a mega magger and he uh, went on Steve Bannon's podcast and take a listen to what he said. Yeah, yeah, I mean, for me, Let's Go Brandon is, and, I, and I've said it in other articles, I, I am a Christian man. Uh, it's For me, it's God first and foremost, I don't follow any one man blindly. Um, some of the media's run with that and said, I don't support Donald Trump. That's absolutely false, Donald Trump is my president and he should still be president right now. Uh, the election was 100% stolen. Um, so I, I just wanna make that clear. Um, I follow Donald Trump because he is my president. It's not political, I just, he's still the president and the election was stolen. I don't, but I don't follow blindly one man, but like Donald Trump is the Lord and Savior, you know, obviously next to whatever that guy's name is. I don't know. Um, Yeezy, Yeezus. Anyway, the point is, is uh, <laughs> there's Schmeck in all his full Schmeckian glory 
and just just very much revealing. And here we have another superstar in the making, a right winger who can say, "Let's go, Brandon, to the president." Oh, and now he's going to be put on all the podcasts. I'm sure Tucker Carlson will have him on as soon as he gets back from his Bahamas vacation or wherever he's gone, or whoever he's tormenting on his time off. Um, it is ridiculous, Nina. I agree with you. This is such a distraction story, but it's also so indicative of the fact that there is no opposition to Biden substantially from the from the right. There isn't, they have nothing to say. It is just, let's go Brandon, but they're not talking about the things that we are talking about. Canceling student debt, supporting the PRO Act, supporting voting rights, right? Ending the filibuster. It's just, no, I don't like him cuz mandates and I don't, there's freedom. Like that, <laughs> there's nothing there. And he continues the interview saying this a cancel culture, you know, it's all the buzzwords. The word cloud of conservative thought was touched in that interview. Um anyway, any I any final departing words? I mean, he definitely made it clear it wasn't a synapse lapse, it was deliberate uh, what he did and just own it, brother. Just own it. and I use that term loosely, just own it. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, now he's but trying to. I mean, it's the same way that it's like. If it weren't clear that Kyle Rittenhouse was absolutely a white supremacist sympathizer, um, now he is because it gives him clout and cachet. And so he's going to completely own it. So uh, look out, Fox News, you got the, the Schmeck hour, um, Schmeck talk. I don't know, we're, we've got to workshop some ideas for Schmeck in the future. Um, but good riddance, I don't want to ever talk about you again. Amen. <laughs> Let's move on. This is probably one of the biggest stories, you know, coming back last week of the year in 2021. Um, the CDC has once again changed their guidelines. Um, okay, that's a tease. I didn't actually, that wasn't a sentence, that was a tease because we're taking a break and, and I know how to do this. All right, stay right there. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back to the Damage Report. Francesca Fiorentini in for John Iderola here with Nina Turner. Um, and as a reminder, Nina, I gotta tell all the good people that I am also the host of a show called The Bituation Room Podcast and the Twituation Room, which is TYT on TYT's Twitch channel every Wednesday, 1, 3 p.m. or 4 p.m. Eastern. So don't miss that, I'll be there tomorrow. And Bituation Room every Sunday. Okay, I'm done. Let's get into this. The CDC has released yet again new guidelines for COVID and quarantine. Uh, now, they are saying that instead of needing to isolate and quarantine for 10 days after getting a positive COVID test, you only need to isolate and quarantine for five. Um, US health officials on Monday cut isolation restrictions for asymptomatic Americans who catch the uh, coronavirus from 10 to five days. Similarly, shorten the time that close contacts need to quarantine. Last week, the agency loosened rules that previously called on healthcare workers to stay out of work for 10 days if they test positive. The new recommendations say that workers could go back to work after seven days if they test negative and don't have symptoms. And the agency said isolation time could be cut from five days or even fewer to five days or even fewer if there are severe staffing shortages. Okay, so that is for healthcare workers, but general in general for all workers, they're saying, and these are recommendations. This is obviously not a mandate. I mean, since when has this country actually had mandates? Um, it's a recommendation to employers and employees, state and local officials. But of course, that's where a lot of state and local officials are taking their guidelines from. Um, so it might not be a mandate, but it is going to be used by the country over. Um, now, this is from Rochelle Walensky, CDC director. She says, quote, not all of those cases are going to be severe. In fact, many are going to be asymptomatic. And we wanna make sure there is a mechanism by which we can safely continue to keep society functioning while following the science, okay? So keep society functioning, hold that in your little coin purse of bad thoughts for a second. I don't know what that is, but it is something now. Um, but let's look at the science, okay? So that was CDC Director Rochelle Walensky. And there's been some conflicting evidence as to whether it is safe to go out of quarantine after five days, even if you've tested positive. Remember, we're in the middle of an Omicron surge across the country. Um, cases are doubling uh, every single day. So this is, um, 
from a an immunologist named Aaron Bromage. Uh, this is on Twitter, he writes, I'm baffled at the CDC's decision to shorten isolation. Here are tests from the same person, day zero, in other words, three days after exposure and day eight. The person still has a huge amount of virus in their nose eight days after testing positive. Quickest clearance, six days, longest, 8.5 days. So you can see day zero, three days after exposure, and then five days later, they're still testing positive. Which I assume means you can still be spreading this. And now apparently this is an antigen test. Apparently PCR tests show um, people who have had COVID to be infected for longer. So they will show, give a positive result for a longer amount of time. But an antigen test will actually more rapidly show that you are testing negative as you recover. Uh, and this is an antigen test, which is still showing after five days or eight days um, that this person is clearly still infected and could steer, could still infect others. Um, but let's get another opinion. An epidemiologist, Michael Mina writes, uh, the CDC's new guidance to drop isolation of positives to five days without negative tests is reckless. Some people say infectious three days, some 12. I absolutely don't wanna sit next to someone who turned positive five days ago and hasn't tested negative. Testing negative to leave isolation is just smart. So right, this isn't a, you must test negative and then you're okay to go back to work. It isn't, hey, employers, make sure to give your workers 10 days off or eight days off or those five days off. Those days must be paid. This is just a completely apolitical, hey, you know, why don't you, you can go back to work after five days? You're fine. You're fine. Don't no need to test negative. Um, Nina, just your thoughts before we go into maybe the why. What are your thoughts overall on on this change from the CDC? Bunch of BS. <laughs> I'll keep it PG. I'm telling you, I'm about to leap out of my skin over here, friend. It is it is ridiculous. It is reckless in every way. And I'm gonna go back to a point that you made from that AP article when this woman <laughs> she said that the you know they made the changes. The new recommendation said workers could go back to work after seven days if they test negative and don't have symptoms. And the agency said isolation time could be cut to five days or even fewer if there are severe staffing shortages. Right. This is for healthcare workers. Keyword severe staffing shortages just magically makes it okay to go back to work. And then you know what? I try to follow the nurses, two friends, mm -hmm. the science and the nurses. And yes. the National Nurses United, they have been tweeting up a storm about this. And one of their tweets read, new weakened CDC government guideline, guidance on isolation for healthcare workers who have tested positive for COVID-19 is reckless and will only result in future transmission, illness, and death. In other words, why are you putting healthcare workers' lives in jeopardy? The very people who are the lifeline for us, you're putting them in jeopardy. But I don't want to. I don't want to step on our lead, friend. I'm gonna stop right there so we can come back and, and no, I'm but keep layering on this. <laughs> no, but that's a really good point. Looking to the National Nurse, Nurses Union is really important, uh, and, and nurses unions across the country. Because absolutely, I imagine you're sick, you're in the hospital. Would you want to be attended by someone who has COVID? What if you, you know, like like con continuing the spread of it? Or are we now just saying, well, that's everyone's just going to have COVID in this ward? Like, what what are I we know. actually saying to people? And what about the healthy staff that doesn't that's have right. COVID? So, and, and how are you, at, I mean, it's just, I understand there are shortages, absolutely. But is this a way to keep people safe in a hospital or is the way to make sure they stay out of the hospital in the first place? And we'll get to a way that maybe they could do that. Um, so given the new CDC guidelines saying that uh, those with COVID uh, don't have to quarantine for a full 10 days, but instead can do it for only five days. Completely cut in half in the middle of, again, an Omicron surge that is hitting the nation. Um, why? I, a lot of people are wondering, why did the CDC do this and why do they do it now? Well, a, a little story dropped right before the holidays, and it seems to indicate uh, a reason for that, uh, which is that apparently the CEOs of major airlines ask the CDC to do exactly this, specifically the CEO of Delta, Ed Bastian. So Bastian 
wrote to the CDC director Rochelle Walensky proposing a five day recommended quarantine period for fully vaccinated individuals who con contract COVID. The existing recommendation calls for a 10 day period of isolation. I don't know whether the fully vaccinated swayed the CDC, who knows, but it went on. There was a sort of a big sell to the CDC director from the head of Delta writing quote, our employees represent an essential workforce to enable Americans who need to travel domestically and internationally. Wrote Bastian along with the airline's chief health officer Henry Ting and medical advisor Carlos Del Rio. With the rapid spread of the Omicron variant, the 10 day isolation for those who are fully vaccinated may significantly impact our workforce and operations. Hmm. In other words, we're gonna lose money unless we put our airline workers back to work before 10 days. Now we've known that many thousands of flights have been canceled over the holidays. Some because of snow, but a lot of them because airline workers and uh, and and flight attendants are actually getting sick. They're getting sick from COVID. The Omicron is incredibly transmissive. It is far more contagious than even Delta was and the original coronavirus. Although, of course, when you are vaccinated and boosted, it may have and it seems to have um, a lesser impact in terms of symptoms. But it doesn't mean you're necessarily not contagious. Um, I just want to read one more thing because it wasn't just Delta. So on Wednesday, CEO of JetBlue Airways, Robin Hayes, issued a separate letter echoing Delta's request to the CDC. We can safely mitigate disrupting disruption to our essential services and further economic harm. Economic harm to whom? Uh, during this Omicron wave by reducing the isolation period from the start of symptoms for those who are fully vaccinated and suffering from a breakthrough inf infection. Nina, your thoughts. Fran, 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 Lord <laughs> have mercy on our soul. You know, this is, I'm calling on Black Jesus right <laughs> about now. The moneyed interests are actually controlling what the CDC has just put out. And, you know, it's been, I've been kind of watching the CDC deeper uh, since mm -hmm. the Trump administration. They seem to model whatever the will is of whoever's in the, in the presidency. Mm -hmm. I, I, it, it, and this is definitely irresponsible. You got nurses standing up as they usually always do, like 99.9% .9 of the time, trust the nurses, baby. When they say this ain't right, this is not right. You even yes. have doctors and other scientists weighing in on this. It is the moneyed interest. Another example of the system is rigged. These big corporations can write to the CDC director and get this director to change the rules, even though it will put lives in jeopardy, lives in danger. I want that CDC director to actually watch Don't Look Up. So this is a <laughs> Don't Look Up moment, Francesca, right yes. about now. Yeah. You know? I mean, no. there is danger approaching. And these fools are sitting up here acting like it's just another thing. And you know, from a policy perspective, we need paid family and medical leave yes. so that people can take the time off that they need to heal. Friend, this is not just about the physical symptoms of the, the virus, if that's not enough to move us, but there are psychological impacts to this, you know, there are economic impacts to this. Right. Not just the physical impact, it's all of that. We are whole as human beings. And these people are just like, oh, nothing to see here. If we have a shortage or the economy is suffering, just send these essential workers back to work. We don't give a damn as long as we keep making money. Right. Economic impact for who? Right. Like there th these CEOs are completely <laughs> arguing that it's their economic impact. Their bottom lines are going to be impacted. Well, why? Why don't you just? Pay people to stay home. Why don't you just take a little right. bit less of a Christmas bonus? I'm sure they both made mega millions in that. You know, like like why don't you just you know pay your airline workers? What what about the economic impact of going back to work? Right? Yeah. Of what about the like and and this entire time, there's been. You know, the CDC has been sort of, oh yeah, this is the health guideline, but this is the first moment we've seen from the Biden administration truly that even something like the CDC, um, it is a nonpartisan issue when it comes to money, that both Democrats and Come Republicans on. make a decision that favors money and the wealthy over working people. 
time and time again. Here's a moment where you could, you know, say, no, you know what? My CDC is not going to do that. But instead, right. this is the most Trumpian stuff we've seen out of the, this CDC and out of this administration in a long time, right? This feels like a Larry Kudlow move. Like Larry Kudlow's like, hey, bravo, you know, yeah. send all these sick people back to work. But and what about talk- their families too, friends? Yeah. You know, a lot of these people have families. And even if they're single, you know, I'm not talking about status or anything, but people have families. They got people who love them that they got to interact with on a regular basis. And you like just the hell with them as workers, the healthcare workers. And then you're also saying the hell with their family. There are some policy measures that could be implemented. Again, pay family and medical leave and also Medicare for all. Right now, universal health care is absolutely needed instead of just listening to the moneyed interests who obviously do not really give a damn. And, you know, this is a moment where, you know, when the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, what affects one directly affects us all indirectly. Fran, this is a very good example of that. Hello, somebody. The pandemic is just, it's just like smelling salts. It keeps on trying to wake us up and we keep on trying to ignore it. At least our leaders keep on trying to ignore this moment. Um, Let's move on to a little different aspect of this because it is important to talk about air travel. So uh, given the new CDC guidelines were impacted by the CEOs of Delta and JetBlue and sort of the airline industry uh, asking them to please, please, please be be concerned for their bottom lines because they need to send workers back before 10 days and five days, you know, just to, to keep on making money slash spreading the virus around. Let's remember that Currently in the United States, domestic travel, there is no requirement to be vaccinated or to test negative when you board a flight. Uh, That has been the case since the beginning of the pandemic and it has not changed. And one could argue and one sees now how clearly the airline industry has had a role to play. Well, lawmakers are not having it anymore. Um, Senator Dianne Feinstein, Representative Eric Swalwell, uh, as well as others have now are now asking the CDC and the FAA to please implement a vaccine check or COVID negative test before flying in a small metal tube across the sky. So this is from Senator Feinstein with air travel returning to pre pandemic levels. It is vital we do everything possible to prevent future spread of COVID-19, further spread of COVID-19. Last week we sent a letter to the CDC and FAA encouraging a vaccine or negative requirement for all domestic flights. Part of this is that negative tests and vaccine requirements are already in place in much of international travel. I had the privilege of going to Costa Rica, had to be vaccinated, had to test negative when I got there and when I came back. Uh, I also had the privilege of going to another state, but the state of Hawaii. Uh, I did it when like it was cool when anyway the point is i went to hawaii <laughs> and and the mayor of the mayors uh, uh, have or the governor of hawaii has said look you're going to be vaccinated so i had to show vax card and you're going to test negative so we had to test negative that is in place because hawaii wants to protect its population so why can't california do it why it doesn't well florida let's you know put that on the side. Why doesn't New York do it? Why don't states inside this country do the same thing and require a negative test or require vaccines? Yes, I understand there's breakthrough cases. You guys, there is, there are breakthrough cases, you can still be contagious. But that's why you double up, have a negative test and have your vaccine requirement. I would feel much safer if I knew that everyone around me was vaccinated and tested negative on that day, right? We know neither of those are airtight perfection. But we know that at least with the two of them, you know, we're going to be making progress on keeping people safe. Uh, Nina, your thoughts on on that sort of the weird holdout that we don't test for when people get on this pl- on a plane? I mean, it definitely gets us closer. We know wearing masks, getting vaccinated, you know, um, making sure to just stay in six feet from people as much as possible. All of those things layered help us get closer to trying to tame this virus. And we're never gonna be able to do it, or it's definitely gonna take us a lot longer unless people really get real about their individual responsibility and helping us try to tame this thing. It's gonna be with us, Fran, for the rest of our natural lives. I believe very much at some point, we're gonna talk about the COVID like we talk about the flu, but we're not there yet because so many people don't wanna do the right thing um, to help us get there. And it doesn't help us 
in at all one mm-hmm. eye older to have the CDC uh, sending mixed messages because they're moneyed masters. Because that's what this is about. They own the donors. Hell, yes. politicians got owner donors. The CDC got owner donors. These, all these fools got owner donors. It doesn't make it easier for us to get there when you have all of these mixed messages being thrown out there about what is the right and responsible thing to do. And then lastly on this point, we must continue to impress upon the people of this world, uh, our nation, but this world that we all have a responsibility to play in this. It doesn't just fall on the healthcare professionals or the politicians, it falls on all of us. And while I'm on this point, the industrialized nations that are withholding the vaccine from poor nations, yeah. I want to use the F word right now. (laughs) What would Jesus do on this one? Oh, yeah. He he would be outraged. It really is a shame, Fran, because we can't be safe in the United States of America. Uh, We can't be safe in North America. If our sisters and brothers and family and friends in South America or Africa or the Asian country, everybody has to be safe. And part of that is making sure that we get masks, that we get the vaccines to people, that we all do what we can to be part of the solution in this, Fran. It, it, yep. it makes no sense to me. This is cruel. It really yes. is. It would have been a better Christmas present if Biden hadn't answered calls from kids and instead just you know, pressured the WTO to drop the vaccine uh, patents. Drop the patents. Scary. That's all we want for Christmas for the world. That's um, right. Get Bono in there. Do they even know it's Christmas? Shut up. I'm sorry. I'm just gonna just mad at Bono now for no reason. Nina Turner, <laughs> we gotta take another break. <laughs> We're gonna check yeah. in with our owner donors, you, right after this. <laughs> Welcome back to the damage report for the final few moments of this amazing hour with Nina Turner, Francesca Fiorentini. Uh, We've been speaking about flights and airlines. And so now it's time for a segment that I want to call Flight Fight. Everybody? That was fun. Can we talk about white on white violence now, please? Finally, is it time? <laughs> um, that was Patricia Cornwall. <laughs> Patricia Cornwall on flight 2790 from Tampa to Atlanta. Not that far, people. Um, screaming without a mask on at another gentleman seated who was drinking uh, to put his mask on. And um, then that ensued. He, she assaulted him, scratched his face. I believe he was bleeding towards the end of that. Um, once again, that was on a Delta flight, and we just got done talking about the fact that Delta CEO is is basically forcing the CDC to create a new guideline that allows him to send all of his workers back to work to deal with this kind of crap. <laughs> Nina, you know, there's Karen videos in the Karen videos in the sky. I think this one. Was um I don't know. It was a cut above. What your reactions? <laughs> a cut above. You got that. Right. <laughs> no pun intended. Yeah, legit. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know how Doctor Richie is gonna outdo this one. You know, he because he has a segment. <laughs> I wish a Karen would. So I'll be with him on Thursday. We're gonna see how he's gonna outdo <laughs> this one. This was absolutely amazing in all of the wrong ways. And you're right, white on white crime, it is a scourge on America. <laughs> and uh, to add a finer point to that, this uh, Karenicity that's going on. I mean, when you know, when you got white men saying to white women, sit down, Karen, okay? <laughs> Houston, we got a problem. No, she was definitely out of line. You can really see that the, the man was uh, taking a drink and 
and sh- and she had her mask down trying to tell him what to do instead of her minding her own business and putting her mask up. This is what Karens do. And she had no right to put her hands on that man. And she definitely had no right to spit on him. I'm telling you, Francesca, somebody spit on you, baby. They want, they asking for a beat down. Oh. I mean, that's just a natural reaction. And, 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 and I'm a woman of peace. Okay, let me just say that. <laughs> but, but it's just a natural reaction that if you spit on somebody, you really do want them to throw some hands at you. I mean, that's one of the nastiest things that you can do to somebody. She had no right to do any of what she was doing. And I hope her behind is arrested and charged for what so she did. The, in fact, uh, that is what happened. Um, when the flight landed, she was detained. Um, they Delta released a statement saying they have zero tolerance for unruly behavior. Situations like this are rare for the vast majority of our customers and Delta has zero tolerance for unruly behavior at our airports and aboard our aircraft. Um, but please continue to give us our money and no, uh, we will not allow our flight attendants to take the time they need to heal from COVID. I mean, this is like, I just being a flight attendant nowadays with just people being so triggered by having to wear a stupid mask on their stupid little faces. Here's my thing about this video. If I were him, I would have definitely put on my mask just because I don't want anyone spitting in my face. I don't want them talking in my face during a pandemic. I don't want the other day I was talking to someone who I was like, oh, we're safe, we're outside. Nina, she spit in my mouth. She said she said something. And you know when someone spits in your mouth by accident, it happens. Yes, it and then happens. I, I didn't know what to do. I, I, well, I just, I had to like wash my mouth out with fire or something. It was very. I did like the hot chip challenge just to get rid of it. Yeah. I don't know if the hot oh. chip kills COVID. But you tested it. I should. I bet you got more. You got more scientific uh, health guideline information <laughs> on that than. The- than the director of the CDC. I will definitely trust what you say when it comes to that. No, no, it, de- it definitely happens. And that's why it's important to wear the mask. You know, I don't know, because I'm trying to figure out, you know, you and I talked about this a little bit. I just want to know what triggered the chick. You yeah. know, was she just walking by from coming from the restroom and she saw the man didn't have a mask on and she just got triggered like that. But you're, you're right. I mean, but he was drinking. I think he was maybe kind of taken aback that she even came at him like that, that he was... Uh, uh, too stunned to put his mask back on, but you do see his bottle, you know, of water, which it is allowed that you could take sips and some bites yeah. of your food. Yeah, um, you know, without your mask, Jesus, right, Jesus, right. Well, let's quickly jump to uh, let's do the F block before we before we end. Um, it's not a, not ending on a high, but uh, we it just uh, one more. One more story for the good people. Um, so a lot of Angelinos have been on a holiday break, but the LAPD has not been on a break uh, from shooting innocent unarmed civilians. So two days before Christmas at a Burlington coat factory in North Hollywood, uh, there were a couple of distress calls um, to uh, because there was a man wielding what appeared to be a bike lock. Police officers came into the situation, about 12 of them in total, um, and they shot at this at, at the person who was apparently um, wielding a bike lock at people, immediately started firing and killed a 14-year-old girl uh, named Vene- uh, Valentina Orellana Peralta, who was in a dressing room with her mother. Uh, attorneys representing the family of Orellana Peralta said in a statement Monday that the girl was in dressing room with her mom trying on Christmas dresses and that she died in her mother's arms. I want to show you this video quickly um, and then show you exactly where the dressing room was. Hey, she's bleeding, she's bleeding. <laughs> So that is the LAPD shooting at the suspect who was also shot and killed. But then you hear some screams in the background. And can I just go to this sh- this photo very quickly um, of the dressing room that was right behind where the suspect was? Uh, that is the dressing room 
that those bullets flew into and killed 14 year old uh, uh, Valentina. And she she was bullets ricocheted off the ground and killed her and you can hear her mom screaming. Um, we don't have time to get into this Nina, but thank you so much for joining us. It is a damn shame and there needs to be accountability. You guys, thanks for joining us, uh, stay tuned. Tragic. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.